begin to call out the name of Jesus. Jesus. Clap your hands and give him a shout. Come on, clap your hands and give him a shout. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name. Let us exalt his name together. Woo! Nothing like the name of Jesus. Let the church say amen. Nothing like the name of Jesus. What a beautiful presence of the Lord is here. Thankful for what we have already heard and received and for what God is going to continue to do. Amen. I understand the um, assignment that I've been given. And uh, I have been placed positioned between the legend and lunch. And um, it is my lucky day. I appreciate all of you friends that have reminded me of that many times. What an encouragement you've been to me. <laughs> I give great honor to this entire bot committee. Thank you for this humbling and honoring and experience. It truly is uh, a joy and a privilege. And um, Bishop, give you honor. And the voice that you have been in my life, Pastor Gentry, this entire church. Love them and appreciate them. My family can't say enough about them, how much I love them, especially uh, Heather and Ava, who have been praying over me and fasting with me. Our great church at home. There are many that have told me they are shutting themselves up for the next hour, praying over me, and I'm so thankful for them and my staff. I give them great honor today. When the bishop called and asked me to do this, I have to admit. Um, I was not expecting that to be what he was going to call me about. I don't know what I was expecting. It's not like we talk all the time, but he called me and asked me, and a little bit of shock came out, and I said, oh, my word. And in typical fashion, he said, we don't need your word. We need God's word. And I said, absolutely, yes, sir, amen. I And so I began to pray <laughs> and seek God. And I will say that within the week, I didn't know the theme. You didn't share it with me at that time. I didn't find out till a couple of months later what the theme was. But I will say that in prayer, God put a verse in my heart. And I believe it's a word of God for us today. Philippians Chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. NLT says, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished. The Jewish Bible says, I am sure of this, that the one who begun a good work among you will keep it going until it is completed on the day of redemption. Amen. Will you pray with me right now? Will you just pray that his word come forth in such a way that we can receive it, respond to it, be changed by it. Father, we thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to know you, to serve you, to be a part of the church of the living God, the kingdom which hath no end. We're so grateful, Lord Jesus, for all that you are to us. I pray, God, that you would anoint every word that proceeds out of my mouth. I'm but a man in your vessel today. And I pray, Lord Jesus, let it be received in the name that is above every name. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I know that I am stating the obvious here when I say that our culture is overwhelmed by consumerism, sexual addiction, anxiety, depression, 
entitlement, grudges, self-absorption, just to name a few. And it would be easy to get caught up in the emotions of life and all the pressure that surrounds it and become frustrated and weary and discouraged and despondent. It's an ugly mix that leaves us stressed and strained. And if we are not careful, can even shake the confidence of the strongest among us. But I would propose to you that we heed to the encouraging words of Paul and let them ring in our ears and in our spirit today. Paul's confidence in the midst of adversity convicted me all over again when studying this out. For if there was anyone that should have been at the very least a little shaken in his faith, it should have been this man. For Paul knew the footsteps, the next footsteps in the corridor might be those of the guards taking him away to his execution. His only bed was the hard, cold stone floor of the dark, cramped prison cell. Not an hour passed when he was free from the constant irritation of the chains, separated from friends, unjustly accused, brutally treated, If ever a person had a right to complain, it was this man languishing, almost forgotten, in a harsh Roman prison. Oh yes, the Apostle Paul had full knowledge of the perplexities which life can throw at us. This is the same man that said in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28, I am more in labors, more abundant in stripes above measure in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beat with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren. In weariness, in toil, in sleeplessness often. In hunger, in thirst, in fastings often. In cold and nakedness besides the other things. What comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. And yet... Even while sitting imprisoned once again, he writes to the church in Philippi and he tells them, be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He said it with such certainty. There is one thing, he said, I'm confident about. This word confident, it's not a weak word. It packs a punch. Miriam Dictionary defines it as full of conviction, certain, having or showing assurance in. Some synonyms are unshakable, unflappable, secure, and assured. In the midst of the prison cell, he is writing encouragement to the church. He is saying, I know it looks bad. I know it's hard to have confidence when everything is so perverse around you. When up is down and down is up. When everything that we stand for is being attacked and persecuted. When I'm sitting here in a prison for doing the right thing. I know it seems like evil is celebrated and good is despised. I get it. It's hard to have confidence after you have seen sin exalted and righteousness ridiculed. It's hard when people that you have trusted in let you down. But Paul tells them again, there is one thing that you can be certain of. There is one thing that you can be confident in. That he that he that he who has begun a good work I wish somebody would go ahead and get a hold of the word of the Lord today. He who has begun a good work. (laughs) 
Who is this he of this verse? Of course, it is God himself. Now notice, Paul does not refer to the good work he himself had done in Philippi. Paul was the missionary who was sent by God to preach the gospel in Philippi. Paul did a great work there. He established the church and he built it up. But then when he writes this letter, he does not refer to all the work that he had done. It was God's work through them. In Acts 14, 27, when Paul and Barnabas returned from their first missionary journey, they gathered the church together in Antioch. Not to give an account of what they had done, but what God had done. And they say, it says on arriving there, they gathered the church together. And they reported all that God had done through them. And how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. It wasn't Paul. It was God who began that work in them. It is not surprising that Paul should emphasize that salvation is all God and not man. See, Paul never forgot where he came from. He never forgot what he had been before God reached down and saved him. He said in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 14, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to this service, his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a part a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. He says, oh yeah, I was a blasphemer. Yes, I was a persecutor. I was violent. He was those things because he adamantly spoke against Jesus and he denied that he was the Messiah. He was a ravenous enemy of the faith. He arrested and imprisoned men and women and tried to make them renounce their faith. He was a violent man. The word Paul uses here, hubris, means a man of insolent and brutal violence. He delighted in inflicting pain on other people. But then as he was on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians, the Lord suddenly appeared to him in Acts 9. And three, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He falls to the ground and he hears a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It wasn't Paul's plan to become a Christian. It was God who initiated the work in him. He says in 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy that in me first Christ Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. You see, not only did God initiate the work in Paul, but Paul remembered how God also initiated the work in the Christians at Philippi. For in Acts 16 and verses 6 and 7, we are told that Paul did not intend to go to Philippi. He wanted to go somewhere else. He wanted to preach in Asia somewhere else in Asia and that seemed to him the right thing to do but it says the spirit would not allow them to and then God gave Paul a vision during the night a man of Macedonia appeared to him and said come over to Macedonia and help us as a result of that vision Paul crossed the sea and landed in Europe when Paul arrived at Philippi the capital of Macedonia he spoke to some women gathered by the side of the the river for prayer and as Paul preached it says the Lord opened the heart of Lydia to respond to Paul's message it doesn't say that Lydia was impressed with Christianity and decided to try it out no the Lord who brought Paul to preach opened her heart and the hearts of her whole family and they all became believers 
Then the demon-possessed girl was delivered by the power of God. Her life was transformed. And this made some people so angry that Paul and Silas get thrown into jail. In the middle of the night, there's an earthquake. And the jailer gets saved and his entire household as well. You see, Paul didn't produce any of this. Rather, he recognized that it was a work of God in Philippi. And Paul says in Ephesians, 2.10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Can I just pause right here and remind us that our confidence must be in God, not in what we can do. Not in what we are capable of, but our trust, our confidence, our faith must be anchored in the almighty God who is able to do anything. Hallelujah. If we're not careful, we can start thinking it's because of what we can produce that is bringing salvation to people. Our, our charisma, our talents, our abilities, our programs, our ministries. No, being confident of this very thing, that he. Being confident of this very thing, not in my own abilities, not in my own giftings, not in my own might or power, but by, but he, my confidence is in him. Hallelujah. It matters in whom we place our confidence. In Philippians 3, Paul tells us, put no confidence in the flesh. It's a divine multiple choice. We either trust in the arm of the flesh or in the arm of the spirit. You will never get to the next chapter in Philippians 4 with that great promise. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Unless you bite the bullet and say, my hope, my trust, my confidence is in the Lord. Hallelujah. When I was 14 years old in junior high, I used to play a game called wall ball. You would all spread out, and one person would throw it at the wall. You had to hit the black top first and bounce it off the wall, and then somebody in the crowd would try to catch it. If it hits you, but you didn't catch it, you were out. Another rule was if you missed catching it and it got by you, then you were out. Well, this particular day, I had brought a brand new wall ball to school. And while playing the game, one of my friends missed catching it, and the ball rode, rolled over to the commons area that was there, right at the feet of what I used to call the trench coat gang. Because they would wear all black, and all of them wore black trench coats. And the leader of that group, who had been held back a couple of times and could have ridden with the Hell's Angels, <laughs> picked that ball up. As I was making my way over to, receive, to retrieve it, about the time I got there, he just reared back and chunked it as far as he could in the opposite direction. Now I know that it's hard to believe looking at me now, but in eighth grade at the age of 14, I wasn't even 100 pounds. <clears throat> I wasn't as ripped as I am today. <laughs> I don't know what you are laughing at. But... At the age of 14 also, I had not yet perfected all the fruits of the Spirit. <sighs> <laughs> and I didn't believe I was as small as I was and I certainly didn't care how big he was in the heat of the moment all I know is when he threw that ball a fire lit in me and it was not the Holy Ghost fire <laughs> I ran right up to him when he was just turning back around after throwing that ball 
with all 100 pounds or less running full speed. I shoved him as hard as I could, knocking him backwards and stunning him, but for a moment in which I was most proud. <laughs> and I yelled when I pushed him at the top of my voice, which is comical within itself when you're 14. <laughs> Go get the ball! <laughs> I'm a real boy. <laughs> <laughs> he spun around towards towering over me. This guy was huge. And he shoved me back, sending, sending me flying backwards, but not knocking me down, which I also was very proud of. <laughs> but then something happened, and the whole trench coat gang rose to their feet. <laughs> About six of them they stood up and they started walking towards me. And in that moment, any ounce of courage or confidence that I had diminished very quickly. And I began to do what anyone who has been raised in church would do. I began to call on the name of the Lord. <laughs> but I didn't let them know that I was calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and in my mind, I thought, this is the way I'm going to die. <laughs> when all of a sudden, I heard a deep, booming voice from behind me say, Dean. For a split second, I thought, so this is what the voice of God sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> then the voice continued, Dean. We got your back. I looked over my shoulder to see about 10 angelic hosts from the football team standing to their feet behind me. The Lord heard my prayer. <laughs> I can't tell you the confidence that came over me in that moment. I puffed my chest out and I said, Go get the ball. <laughs> and I, when I tell you, it's no exaggeration. That big old dude took off running. He ran and he grabbed that ball and he came bringing it back to me with an apology. And he was kind to me the rest of my school years. But can I tell you, that confidence didn't come over me. It didn't come over me because of my abilities. It came over me because of the 10 that stood behind me. Can I remind us today that there is one that is with us that we can trust in. There is one that you can lean upon. There is one that you can place your confidence in and know that what he has begun in you He's going to continue until the day of redemption. Somebody give him praise right now. Come on, somebody thank him for who he is. Somebody worship him because he's the mighty God. Woo! Come on, the one who walked on water, the one who raised the dead, the one who made the lame to walk and the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the dumb to sing. His power is such that he can do whatever he pleases without difficulty or resistance. He cannot be checked. He cannot be restrained. He cannot be frustrated. How worthless is his eternal counsels that they would be if his power could not execute him, them. He is the all-powerful, almighty God. I feel something breaking loose in this house. I feel some confidence coming back to somebody who has walked into this place discouraged, who has walked into this house despondent. 
You can be confident in him. Woo! Oh, his mercy would be feeble and weak if he were destitute of power to relieve and his promises an empty sound without the strength to accomplish them. But oh, great is his power and his faithfulness to us. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. In our own abilities, we will fail and we will get discouraged. But like Paul so beautifully stated, we can be confident in him who started this work. Woo. Paul goes on to say, he who ha has begun a good work in you. When Paul said in you, he is talking about salvation. Being born again, the beginning of a good work in us is salvation found in and through Jesus Christ. The prophet Ezekiel describes it beautifully in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put in you a new spirit. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And can I say what God begins? He also continues in us. For he who begun a good work in you will perform it. That means he will carry it on to completion. What does that look like? Sometimes it's through answered prayers and victories. But other times it's through trials and difficulties. I have discovered that the best growth often happens through some struggles. You and I can't grow in Christ likeness without some struggles. We can't come to spiritual maturity apart from being put through the fire. The fires of disappointment, heartaches, and trials are all a part of the great process of God continuing the good work he began. We don't like to hear this, but it's true, isn't it? A bar of steel worth $5 when made into ordinary horseshoes is then worth $10. If this same $5 bar is manufactured into needles, the value rises to $350. If it is made into delicate springs for expensive watches, it can be worth more than $250,000. The same bar of steel is made more valuable by being passed through one blast furnace after another, again and again, hammered and manipulated and beaten and pounded Finished and polished, it is finally ready for the delicate task ahead. We may not be able to understand it now, but in the future, we will see how these things are all a part of the great process of God continuing the good work that he began in us. He has an ultimate purpose, and if you believe that, shout amen. And so what is the purpose of this work? Paul gives the answer, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We are being prepared for the day of Jesus Christ. The great day when the King of Kings will return to this earth in power and glory. This is the day of God's final triumph over evil. And when Christ comes, we will share in his glory. For Paul describes this coming glory in Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 19. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. 
the NIV says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The picture Paul draws here is of the whole creation craning its neck, waiting with eager expectation for that glorious day when Christ returns and the sons of God are revealed. At a wedding, when the bride comes down the aisle, what do we do? We all crane our necks, waiting with eager expectation to see that bride. Everyone looks. Let us be reminded today that we are the bride of Christ. We are being prepared now for the day of Jesus Christ when he comes as the bridegroom to claim his chosen bride. Is there anybody still excited about that coming day? Come on, do we still get excited about that great day? Or are we too contented in our present day? Oh, God, help us to look forward to that great day when all of heaven will crane its neck, looking and waiting and expecting. Mm. Oh, on that day, all oh, the universe will stand in awe of what the grace of God has done. In Ephesians 5, 26 through 27, Paul says that right now he is making the church holy, cleansing her by the washing of the word in order to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Nothing God permits in our life is accidental or without design. He is shaping us. He is preparing us for the glorious future that he has in mind for us. And when the whole universe will stand in awe at the workmanship of God, by the grace of God, we are destined to shine like the sun in glory in the day of Jesus Christ. And that, good brothers and sisters, is why Paul says while sitting in a prison cell, I am confident of this very thing that he who begun a good work in you, he will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. His confidence is based on the character of God himself because God never starts a work and leaves it unfinished. I said, God never begins a work and leaves it unfinished. He's going to finish what he started. If you're thankful for it, give him praise. Give him a shout. Rejoice right now. Woo! Hallelujah. God never starts a work and leaves it undone. In Genesis 2, we read that God finished his work. What God started on day one, he saw it through to the end. Oh, yes, friend, if you call him Alpha, then be certain to call him Omega. If you should ever call him beginning, be sure to call him the ending. If you need to say author, then complete his name with the finisher for the one who started this work, for the one who started this work, for the one who started started this work in you will not punch out before the job is done. He's going to He's going to finish it. He's going to finish it. Thank God that my hope in Christ does not rest upon my willpower. It rests upon the fact that God would never have started the work in me if he had not decided to finish it. Paul 
Paul says the same thing in Romans 5.10. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. <laughs> Paul is saying, if Christ died for you and I, when we were an enemy and a rebel and hated him, how much more then will God keep and sustain us and finish the work he began? The very character of God guarantees the completion of the work. Therefore, we can be sure, we can be confident in the fact that what God started in us will be completed one glorious day. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption. And this mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh death, where is your sting? Oh hell, where is your victory? For the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Something's getting ready to break loose in a moment. I wish somebody's faith would go ahead and begin to reach out. Hallelujah. You can stand with me. I'm closing. So here's what God told me to tell you on this Wednesday afternoon. Keep at it. Stay in the fight. Keep waving that bloodstained banner of truth while you run this race. For your labor is not in vain for what God has started. What God has started, he is going to continue until it is complete. Hallelujah. Oh, through all the hurts, through the losses, through the disappointments, through all the challenges, through all the trials and the tribulation and the uncertainties, you can say like Paul did of this, I am confident that he which hath begun a good work of salvation, will continue to do that good work to prepare you for that great day of redemption. So here's what I've come to say. Preach with confidence. Sing with confidence. Pray with confidence. Teach with confidence. Plant churches with confidence. Go to the unreached nations with confidence. Lead with confidence. Build churches with confidence. Reach souls with confidence. Teach Bible studies with confidence. <laughs> that cannot be shaken by the shifting sands of this world around us. You can be assured, you can be confident that God is going to finish what he started. Will you lift your hands right now all across this building? You may have walked into this conference discouraged and uncertain about what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds our tomorrow. I pray you walk out confident out of this service today in the simple fact that God is a finisher. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
don't stop now. There's a day coming where he will say it's finished. It's complete. Well done. Good job. And not just for us, but for all those we have led, for all those we have witnessed to, for all those we have discipled. It's going to be worth it all. Some beautiful, glorious day of this. I am confident. Pray for a renewed confidence right now. Pray for a renewal of confidence in this God who is faithful. Woo! He's a finisher of our faith. He's a finisher of our faith. Will you reach over right now and pray for a brother and a sister? Will you begin to pray a renewed confidence in them that what God has started, that what he has begun He's going to finish. He's going to finish. 